mobilization. Please welcome Nils Gilman. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do today is introduce a, a new concept, um, the concept of deviant globalization. Um, deviant globalization is an umbrella term. It's not working. Ah. Deviant globalization is an umbrella term that describes um, the unsanctioned flow of um, goods and services that are considered morally, um, morally retrobate, rep, 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 reprobate. We might say, to summarize, this global flow of repugnant goods and services. Now, this global flow of repugnant goods and services leverages the infrastructure of licit globalization, mainstream globalization, to enable these flows. So this includes uh, communications infrastructure, financial infrastructure, um, and transportation infrastructure. These, uh, these deviant flows form what I call deviant industries, and the people who organize these deviant industries are what I call deviant entrepreneurs. Let's go through a few of these industries. So on the one hand, we might talk about strictly illegal goods, such as global narcotics. We call that deviant pharma. Or we can talk about um, legal goods that are procured or trafficked in an illegal manner, such as bunkered Nigerian oil, which we can see happening here. Or we can talk about, pardon me, pardon me, or we can talk about illegally harvested uh, minerals, conflict minerals. Um, that, uh, such as blood diamonds, which are the most famous, but gold also gets harvested the same way, and also more exotic minerals, such as coltan, um, which is powering the mobile phone that's sitting in every one of your pockets. Um, we can also talk about uh, illegally harvested wildlife. This can range things from Russian and Indonesian timber that's destined for IKEA factories, uh, to South African abalone, uh, which is destined for the dim sum palaces of Guangzhou, or rhinoceros horns, which form uh, a kind of homeopathic Viagra substitute in much of East Asia. Or we can talk about counterfeit goods, which Robert was just talking about. Um, Louis Vuitton bags, Prada shoes, Microsoft Windows, Marlboro cigarettes, there's all sorts of things like this. Um, or we can talk about uh, things that are perfectly legal, supposedly, but are subject to massive regulatory control, such as illegal immigration or um, e-waste disposal. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about the ways in which these economies have a lot in common. I've spent the last 10 years studying a number of these different industries. And what really surprised me as I looked at all these industries is the common structural elements that, uh, that unify the ways in which these industries uh, are put together and the way in which they've scaled up over the, last, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. They all begin with a similar point of departure. Um, they all begin with a similar point of departure. Uh, that point of departure is there's some kind of a ban. So we say, for example, um, we don't want you, we don't want you hacking, all right? So we're going to say, we're going to make that illegal. What that does is it drives, uh, it drives a fundamental change in the moral view of that, uh, of that particular act. Um, and what unifies these industries is not the fact that these people have a common criminal character, but that they're global business people, OK? They're putting together global businesses for the same reason that people put together mainstream global businesses. It's because they're unifying buyers in one place with sellers in another. And they're taking advantage of differences in prices and regulations in different places. So in the deviant software industry, for example, in the hacking industry, hackers in, uh, say, Romania will come along and hack into computers in the United States because it's much easier to run a computer hacking business from Romania where there's much less law enforcement. The linchpin of all these economies, of course, is the deviant finance industry. One to three trillion dollar industry, which is what brings the black market money over into the mainstream economy. All of these, all of these black market economies rely on a gradient, on taking advantage of a gradient, a moral gradient, between the rules and regulations that happen in one part of the world and that then get played out in another part of the world. So what do I mean by that, by a moral gradient? So rules get passed in one particular place that say we're going to ban a certain kind of activity. We're going to say we don't want 
you to be allowed to take drugs. So we say no, on, we say no to drugs, all right? We say we don't want you to be able, we don't think anybody should have to sell sex or organs for a living. So we say no to sex or organs, uh, sex or organs being sold for a living. But in some other part of the world, there's somebody else who wants to do those things, all right? There's people who need an organ or want to buy sex. Um, and uh, what do those people do? They go to market and they say, I'd like to have uh, a particular, I'd like to buy these things. Usually this happens on a regionally differentiated basis. Why does this happen? It's because enforcement of these laws typically is very different in different parts of the world. The moral, they may be, and this enforcement happens maybe because there's a moral difference. People may view prostitution in morally different terms in one part of the world versus another, or it can be because of economic differences. Your moral calculus on how you look at, say, harvesting that last rhino in the forest looks really different if you're rich than if you're poor and trying to put bread on your kid's table. Or it can happen simply because the state itself in some part of the world is not as effective as it is in another part of the world. And so it isn't able to enforce the regulations that it may have formally agreed upon through some kind of an international forum. And what I'd like to do is talk about one particular industry in some detail. And that is the organ harvesting industry. Um, In 1982, cyclosporine, which was a drug um, that suppresses the immune, uh, the rejection response, uh, was commercialized. And for the first time, organ transplantation became something that could be viably done on a long-term sustainable basis. Before that, it was just a last-minute last, um, last resort that kept people alive for a few more months. Now people can survive for years after they've had an organ uh, transplant. Um, but, uh, um, uh, but unfortunately, there are all sorts of rules that we have, particularly in the West, restricting uh, people from actually trading uh, organs. And there's an increasing demand for organs because uh, people have all sorts of needs for hearts and livers and lungs and kidneys in particular. Um, but we've banned, the, we've banned the sale of those things uh, because we consider it uh, morally repugnant for anybody to have to sell those kinds of organs. Now, on the other hand, there's still this demand. People need their kidneys. People can sit on dialysis for years and years and years and not get the kidney that they need. And this is where deviant entrepreneurs step in to fill the gap. So today, there's a global trade in organs. The three places that have emerged in particular as epicenters of the, uh, of the organ trade are Turkey, the Philippines, and South Africa. So each one of those has developed a separate network of connecting supply and demand. So in Turkey, for example, um, they, have a, they have a medical tourism business that's focused on organ transplantation. Uh, they, they bring in, uh, they bring in uh, buyers, usually from, uh, from either uh, Israel or North America or Europe, and then they bring in and then they uh, procure organs, typically from the peasants of Eastern Anatolia or from uh, or from desperate people in Eastern Europe who are willing to sell these things. South Africa has a slightly different network. They're also catering to Israelis, also uh, also to Gulf Arabs and to people in South Asia. They procure their organs a little bit of a different place. They don't get their organs locally because many of those buyers don't want to get a black kidney. So they actually fly the donors in, typically from Brazil, to actually give the, do give the donation in real time. Or there's the Philippines, which specializes in, bring, uh, in selling organs to East Asians and to, uh, and to North Americans, and they do source their organs locally in the slums of Manila. Typically, the donor will get anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000, and the recipient will pay $100,000 and the entrepreneurs will keep the difference. This is the, uh, this is the deviant economy. And the same exact logic applies across all the different deviant industries that I just was going through. So why are we talking about this now? Hasn't the illicit economy, the deviant global, the deviant global economy, been around for a long time? The answer is it absolutely has. But it's gotten much, much bigger. It's growing probably at twice the rate of the global economy, as Robert was just referring to. But what's changed is that what used to be a sort of archipelago of local illicit schemes, a bunch of mom and pop operations, if you will, have been scaled up and rationalized across the globe. And we now have a globalized, interconnected illicit economy uh, that consists of a series of interconnected supply chains between all these different illicit industries. And the players that are in this have done the same thing to those economies that Walmart has done to mom and pop shops all over the United States and increasingly in other parts of the world. They put those guys out of business and they've created these global supply chains. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about why that is. There's basically two reasons. The first one is that they can take advantage of the systems of globalization itself. So one system they can take advantage of is the global intermobile shipping system. The same containers that bring over iPods and laptops 
from, uh, from China can ship back the e-waste to China to be recycled. Um, the same, um, the same, uh, uh, the same global civil aviation network that brings people from um, that brings people in the global north on a cold winter day to sit on southern beaches um, and enjoy themselves can also bring perverts from the global north who want to pray and have sex with underage boys or girls in the global south. Likewise, um, the global financial system that creates tax havens that companies like Google and other multinational corporations uh, can use to do tax avoidance schemes or to lubricate uh, immediate financial transactions is also a perfect system for creating money laundering vehicles that are really hard to detect. Um, and finally, the global telecommunications network, which allows you to keep in touch with your parents or your children when you're backpacking around, uh, around Asia, also allows uh, hackers a direct line into your living room or your business. But there's a second reason that's even more important for why deviant globalization has increased so dramatically in the last 20 years. And that actually connects very much to the things we've been hearing about in the last couple of days, now, in the last couple of hours. Now, it used to be. Um, that during the Cold War, we talked about the three worlds of development. There was the first world of liberal capitalism, the second world of the communist bloc, and the third world of underdeveloped, or perhaps more, perhaps more optimistically, we can say developing countries. Um, now, even though there were vast differences, and we tend, to, uh, we tend to emphasize the differences between these three worlds of development, there was one commonality. And that was, for at least the first 30 years after the end of the Second World War, so from about 1945 until about 1975, there was kind of a consensus across these three worlds. The state was responsible for providing social protection and economic opportunities to the population at large. In the 1970s, for a bunch of reasons we I don't have time to go into now, that consensus began to break down. Basically, there was stagnation, stagflation in this country. Um, many countries in the developing world began to experience um, financial crises. They then had to go through structural adjustment programs. And it, uh, in all over the world, and of course there was the collapse of communism that uh, took place slowly over the 1980s and culminated in the fall of the Berlin Wall, and in all of these three systems, we began to see a retraction of the state from the economy. So the state pulled back from what Daniel Jurgen calls the commanding heights and took over contr and, and released control to the private economy. But that also meant that the state was giving up its function of providing social protection to people, individuals within that economy. Um, now, what was the response of people to that? Well, the basic response of people to that, to the rising inequality, to the global financial crisis, to the fact that the state wasn't protecting them, is to engage in what I like to call survival entrepreneurship. Um, what do we mean by survival entrepreneurship? Well, Robert was talking about going into the informal economy, and that certainly is one option, and that's the option that most people choose. But some people have a little bit more of an aggressive approach. I always think of the way Tony Montana and Scarface He's washing dishes after he gets to, to Miami from, uh, from Cuba, and he says, I don't want to do this. Uh, I won't quote exactly what he said. This is a family audience. Um, and he says, I don't want to do this. Uh, and he actually goes into the drug dealing business. And a lot of people have realized that the one bankable asset they have in this world where the state no longer is protecting them and no longer offering them opportunities is the opportunity to engage in moral arbitrage. Sometimes that means selling part of themselves, maybe their kidney, for example, or maybe their labor working in an e-waste factory or recycling, uh, a recycling environment. Or sometimes it means taking advantage of the unfortunate souls and bodies around them by organizing these industries uh, to take advantage of these things. So this is what I refer to as the hollowing out of the developmental state. And this is a crucial piece of the action for explaining why uh, why deviant globalization has taken off in the last 20 or 30 years. This is, in fact, is almost a rule of deviant globalization. Deviant globalization happens most fiercely in the places where the state is being dismantled. So in the 1990s, it was Russia and the Balkans and Africa, which had been subjected to these structural adjustment programs where the state was forced to downsize in order to get bailed out by the international financial institutions like the IMF. But we can see that today, there's all sorts of other places where the state is being forced to downsize in active ways, either by fiat from above. So in the case of Greece, for example, uh, the financial crisis in Greece is forcing the Greek government to massively contract, um, to massively contract uh, the protections offered by the state. So they're cracking down on unions. They're cutting back on, uh, on, on, on wages. They're laying people off from the public sector. Um, they're forcing people to pay taxes many times for the first time. And so what are going to be the options for the Greek people? Well, the Greeks are sort of in a perfect place to engage in this kind of moral arbitrage. 
They're, both, they're at the periphery of the European Union, both morally and politically, and they have a grievance. I expect that what we should see as the Greek state is downsized over the next coming years is an enormous increase in the headlines we see coming out of Greece around money laundering, drug trafficking, human trafficking, sex work, and so on. Many of these things, because this is going to be the one bankable asset the Greeks have. They're inside the European Union, and yet they're on the periphery of the European Union, and they don't have the social protections. People will engage in survival entrepreneurship of this form. And it's not just Greece, by the way. This is the byproduct you see whenever the state is downsized, or whenever you see state uh, restrictions on the economy begin to be lifted. So we can begin to maybe expect to see similar things coming out of Egypt, or maybe out of Tunisia, or maybe soon out of Yemen and Syria. So this is the, this is the uh, unexpected underside of liberalization of the economy. Finally, let me conclude by asking what about the future of deviant globalization. Now, when I get asked about what is to be done about deviant globalization when I'm working with my clients, um, my, my basic advice is pretty simple. You have to decrease these, these uh, moral arbitrage opportunities. What does that basically mean? That basically means harmonizing the laws and regulations across different geographies so you won't have these kinds of arbitrage opportunities. The most important piece of that, actually, is rebuilding state capacity in much of the global south. That means development. Development is actually the solution. But it's even more important to emphasize it's about state and institutional development. The state needs to be able to put into place protections for people so that they're not going to want to go into this. And it's going to need to develop the enforcement capacity so that the truly criminal elements that are engaging in this can actually be cracked down on. Otherwise, if you don't do that, for example, by, when you ban methamphetamine in the United States, it just pushes production into Mexico. Or if you ban organ transplantations and effectively crack it down in one part of the global economy, it's just going to shift the industry to some other part of the global economy. So that's the basic, that's the basic uh, message, global harmonization. But what I'd like to do is say that's just actually dealing with the symptom. That's just treating the symptom of deviant globalization. If we actually want to deal with the underlying cause of deviant globalization, which is this retreat of the state, we need to think a little bit harder about what, it, what we need to do. And I think this is a perfect forum for us to be thinking about this. So for the last 20 or 30 years, we've made a one-way bet as a global society on becoming more globally integrated and decreasing the amount of state power. Okay, And the result has been a lot of economic growth, but there's also been a lot of sort of unexpected unpleasant consequences. So global financial crises have become ever more recurrent and ever more severe. Global wealth inequality has increased quite dramatically, both within societies, not so much globally, but especially within individual societies. And of course, deviant globalization is the third part of that equation. This wasn't the way it was supposed to turn out. I mean, if you listen to people like Tom Friedman, depicted here in the upper right, <laughs> um, we, we were supposed to get. Um, we were supposed to get the benefits of globalization, but it wasn't supposed to destroy the state. He talked a little bit about the golden straitjacket that required that you restrict the actions of the state, but he didn't expect that that would mean the wholesale downsizing of all the social protections that we associate with welfare states or mixed economies. We didn't actually get there, though. The world we got to was the world of deviant globalization. And the result has been there's been a backlash against globalization, an anti-globalization movement, which has rightly associated globalization with all sorts of ills, exploitation, growing wealth inequality, financial crises, and the kinds of things I've been talking about today. I would submit, though, that deglobalization is not a good opportunity. If we move towards a less globally integrated society, and the way we try to solve the lack of state protection is by pulling away from the, uh, pulling away from the globalized market and turning inward in the way that, for example, Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela is doing, um, we're likely to end up in a world that's a lot more closed off and a lot less rich and vibrant. And it's, and it's questionable how much that's actually a way to sustain growth in a world that's interconnected. As all of us here know, the sharing of knowledge and information across the global economy is central to us being able to maximize the growth potential that we have everywhere in the world. And Hugo Chavez is really not uh, creating those kinds of opportunities for his people by turning inward. The worst opportunity of, of all, the worst, the worst possibility of all, rather, is actually in the lower left-hand quadrant. What happens if people push for a deglobalization, but we don't even get the state economy? Then we'll end up in the world that Thomas Hobbes described, which is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so what I would submit to you as a final thought is how do we get into the upper right-hand uh, right corner? How do we get the world that Thomas, Tom Friedman promised us in the 1990s that we would get to? 
We're not getting there right now because the state is still being downsized. The debate right now in Europe is how badly, how quickly should we downsize in Greece? How much should we pull back in the rest of southern Europe? The debate in the United States is how quickly should we, sh should the US government pull away from providing social security, medical care, and so on. That's the wrong debate because that's actually only going to increase our push towards the left side of the spectrum where the best case scenario is a world of more deviant globalization and the worst case scenario is the Hobbesian world. How do we push to the right? How do we reinvigorate the world? And one final thought on that point. There's been a lot of discussion today that hinted at the 1970s. We're in a kind of 1970s moment. And it's absolutely true. We're in a moment of transition and crisis. But I would submit that we're actually, the moment of transition and crisis we're in today is much more like the moment of transition and crisis that we were in in the 1930s, the previous great period of crisis, where we had a period of rising wealth inequality in the 1920s. We, um, there was uh, you know, the New Gilded Age of the 1920s led to a huge stock market crash. And the response all over the world was to bring the state back in. We had the New Deal here, but there were also more sinister forms of it in Europe in the form of fascism and communism. How do we get to a world where the state provides good services, can harmonize state effectiveness all over the world without turning to those kinds of authoritarian solutions? Thank you very much.